Well, thank you to the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. This is a really special and unique opportunity to talk directly uh, to you all and uh, with you all. And thank you for coming. It's a um, it's an exciting time, and I think you you see that. And um, there aren't many forums like this. Um, this is uh, this is really special. So um, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Paul Dole sort of talked a, a bit about sort of what's so exciting now. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about sort of how do we get there. Um, and it turns out it's actually a relatively uh, long story. Um, despite the sort of recent excitement, this has been work that's been going on for more than a century. And so in a, a few different stories I'll uh, sort of walk through today, I want to talk about sort of um, how do we ever know that the immune system mattered in cancer? How do we figure that out? Um, how do we get to this point where we're now treating patients with therapies that have the potential to substantially increase their, um, their life, both in terms of their quality of life and their length of life? Um, and along the way, how did we learn about how to harness the immune system for the treatment of cancer? Um, this is a, a sense of a timeline that at the bottom of the, of the slide here, um, and you can see that this, this is indeed a long story. Um, and each of these will represent sort of a, a few different stories that we'll go through. Um, but I, I think the sort of linear timeline gives sort of a false sense that this was sort of one step along the next, that it was the sort of the next thing that came naturally from the first thing. And in fact, the story has a lots of um, uh, successes and a few setbacks, um, and along the way has led to what has been a tremendous rise uh, in the use of immunotherapies for the treatment of cancer. Before uh, sort of starting about how do, we, how do we get here, I thought it would be useful to sort of set the stage of where are we here and why does this matter? Um, and this, this is the same sort of spider plot that Dr. Portal showed, um, but what's tremendous is this was a melanoma patient, uh, patients with melanoma that were treated with a combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab. And what you can see is that although a few patients had a growth of their tumor, which is indicated by an increase in their tumor, many of these patients had a substantial decrease in their tumor size and that lasted for a long time. This was so substantial that they had to make up a new number in order to quantify just how many people benefited. This 80% regression in the tumor volume was never been seen before. And so this was a totally new metric that had to be made up in order to encapsulate the true benefit of these sorts of therapies. To put a more personal face on this, this was a, a picture of a, a woman, a 96-year-old woman with head and neck cancer, who was treated with a pdl one therapy. And this was presented uh, by Neil Siegel at ASCO this past year. And you can see that uh, before beginning therapy, she had this large tumor at the bottom of her, um, uh, this is her jaw. And just one month after beginning therapy, the tumor had shrunk tremendously. And uh, Dr. Siegel had coined this the smile sign of immunotherapy, and I think that's probably the right way to describe it. Um, but this sort of, this is, these are the patients that we're seeing. Um, some of you may be them as well. Um, and this is, this is why uh, we're talking about this at all. It turns out that this, this uh, sort of story started with a very similar picture, actually. Um, this is a, a gentleman, a 31-year-old gentleman, who was uh, treated at what ultimately became Memorial Hospital in New York um, by a surgeon named, well, actually, he wasn't treated by this particular surgeon, but William Coley, um, was a surgeon um, at what became Memorial Hospital. And he uh, was a surgeon treating uh, sarcoma patients. And there was one patient in particular whom he had to amputate, and unfortunately that young patient ultimately died. But it pushed him to ask about whether there was alternative ways of trying to treat these cancers. And he looked through the, uh, both the literature and the case reports of, uh, of this hospital and found a few cases, including this gentleman here, who had been uh, infected with a, a type of infection um, which we now know to be um, streptococcus. Um, and during the infection and for seven years thereafter, this tumor that was at the base of his skull there had regressed. It happened during the infection, and this picture was taken seven years afterwards. He found this a gentleman who was taken care of by a, a Dr. Bull, and you can see that that tumor had not come back and remained scarred down. And this, this showed that there's something, there's something about the response to infection that was able to also treat cancer. He then uh, published a series of 10 cases of patients that he had treated on his own, as well as what was a rather remarkable uh, case series where he found all the cases in the literature, uh, beginning with this case in 1868, of a patient that had developed this infection and had a regression of their tumor. 
he ultimately treated a, a small handful of patients and over the course of his lifetime, many, many patients with this sort of infection, purposely giving them an infection to induce a fever and hopefully a regression of their cancer. Unfortunately, this, this medicine, uh, to the extent that it was, also resulted sometimes uh, in infection and death of the patient, um, which was at least one of the reasons why this medicine isn't what we use today, um, understandably. Um, Dr. Coley also ran into what was, at the time, the most remarkable advance in cancer therapy uh, was the advent of radiation and the use of radiation to treat cancers. And as radiation took over, uh, cancer immunotherapy uh, took a back seat. Um, but there are a few legacies of Dr. Coley, including being a, a founder of the concept of immunotherapy's use in cancer. Um, and one of them is his daughter, uh, Helen Coley, who ultimately founded uh, Cancer Research Institute, which is an organization um, uh, that uh, funds and organizes cancer immunotherapy research. Uh, he, I, she found his uh, papers in the 1930s and ultimately was his uh, champion through the 1940s and 50s and started um, CRI. The reason I mention her here is just to emphasize how important single people, even non-physician, non-scientist people can be as advocates, as um, important champions of this work. Um, and uh, she's a, a prime example, as are all of you. Um, and the other reason is that um, because of their particular focus on immunotherapies, um, there is a, a series of webinars about immunotherapies and cancer research that I think are sort of mimicking some of the, the, uh, the videos that are, have been made by Dr. West and Grace, um, but that's a useful resource uh, potentially. Um, another one of the uh, legacies of, um, of Dr. Coley and Coley's toxin is the idea that you can use infections to try and treat cancers. And this is one of the very few, if not only, types of infections that we use to treat cancers. And this is what's called uh, BCG. It's a type of uh, tuberculosis uh, bacterium um, and is actually now routinely used to treat bladder cancers. The concept is that you inject just small bits of this sorts of uh, um, bacteria into the bladder of patients that have bladder cancers. And that in this, you can see in this initial publication in 1970s, that of these seven patients, six of the seven ha had over this is a few years later, had um, regression of their bladder cancers, uh, and many of them don't come back. Um, and so this is just uh, one example of how infections can actually be used uh, to try and treat cancers. I think another uh, legacy, uh, and one that we'll start to hear more and more about in the coming years, is the use of oncolytic viruses to treat cancers. And the same concept applies, is how can you use an actual infection in order to induce an effective immune response? This, is, um, this was just reported at ASCO in 2014 as a type of herpes virus called TVEC, in which you inject bits of the virus into individual components of this melanoma. Those, not every area is injected. You can see uh, several months later that all the melanoma is gone. This is a, a, a sort of mouse experiment that shows the same thing, but I think is part of what's exciting in the next wave of immunotherapies for cancer. This is a mouse with a small bit of melanoma on its backside and another one on the other side. And in this one side here, it's injected with a virus called Newcastle disease virus. And additionally, there's an injection of ipilimumab to the mouse. And you can see in this table that if you give nothing to the mouse, neither the tumors, neither on the right or the left, go away. But if you give the virus, this area goes away in about half of them. And this area goes away in about a quarter of them. Um, I'm sorry, and this area goes away in about a quarter of them. If you give just ipilimumab alone, you get similar results. But if you give both the virus and ipilimumab, you get reduction in this area as well as the other area that's not injected with the virus, demonstrating that there's an ability of, of circulating parts of the immune system to induce immune response if it can be taught to do so. One of the questions uh, in the early 1900s was what are those components? What are the pieces of a cancer that allow it to be recognized by a cancer? I'm sorry, by the immune system. And much of uh, this gets its start from Paul Ehrlich, who is a German um, uh, scientist. Um, and he developed a multitude of things. Uh, but one of them was the whole field of histopathology, the ability to stain specific parts of cancer and to see what the individual components were. And using various dyes, he demonstrated that individual components of each cell with various dyes made different colors. And it seemed that the different physical or chemical properties of a dye bound differently to different parts of the cell. And that there was individual ways in which a 
a dye and a part of the cell linked together. And this was part of what was termed sort of a lock and key idea, that there was individual dyes or other parts that were circulating, individual parts of the cell that could link with one another. And this ultimately um, led to the idea, um, what was called the side chain theory of immunity, which was that, that there were individual parts of a cell that could bind to parts of toxins. In the same way that there are toxins and infections, there are individual parts on the cell that bound to those toxins. And if the cell was able to survive that given infection, those side chains were able to help prevent that infection in the future. He termed the coin receptor, which we use all the time now. And this idea, which was mostly a postulate at the time, was remarkably, um, was remarkably accurate and has led to uh, the development or the identification of what are called antibodies. These are circulating receptors in your own body that recognize specific things called antigens. And this is the lock and key. This is the antibody with the antigen. And the, the idea of how you use this for treatment was he had termed a, a magic bullet, which was that if you could identify the specific antigens on the surface of cells that make them different, you could try and treat just that cell. If you could find what makes a melanoma cell a melanoma cell, how it looks on its surface, the way you stain it with a dye, you could use an antibody that targets just that antigen to try and treat it. And it turns out that that's remarkably true. And the use of what are now called monoclonal antibodies to treat cancers has the, been the tremendous wave since the 1970s. You've heard all these medicines, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, rituximab, et cetera. You hear at the end that term, MAB, and that denotes any monoclonal antibody. All of these medicines that we're using now are monoclonal antibodies because they target a specific antigen, whether that's PD-1 or PD-L1. Um, but that's where the, all of this got started. His, he postulated then that if it weren't for the concept of having, of cancers having individual antigens and the immune system ever existing, that there would be many more cancers, but that because of this circulating system, the ability to identify cancers and eliminate them by the immune system, uh, we're, actually, we're here and that we're not ravaged by cancers. 